Okay. Is this coming out? It seems to. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, this is, uh, should hopefully be a, a light on the technical, heavy on the fun side kind of talk. Uh, this was actually uh, first requested by John Baldwin, who came to me and said, well, can you talk about the history of the demon? And I said, well, I've never really given a talk like that before. And the problem is that I ha have lots of stuff I want to show. And so I said, well, it's going to be in San Jose, so you can just, uh, you know, drive on down. So I brought a giant suitcase, mostly that's full of things like T-shirts, which I'll, I'll go through and talk about uh, as we get to the relevant parts of the talk. At any rate, uh, I'm mostly going to go through the slides, but then I'll, I'll also so show some of the shirts and other uh, things that are up here. Uh, after it's all over, you're welcome to come up and, and, and pour through and look at these. All right, so let's start with the name of the demon. Uh, the demon never had a name. He's just the BSD demon. But people just couldn't cope with the fact that the demon didn't have a name, and so they just kept coming up with names. And someone decided the name was Chuck. And I mean, there's a lot of names they could have come up with, but Chuck was the person that drove me crazy in high school. And there was no way the demon was going to be named Chuck, although you'll see there's one shirt up here that's labeled Chuck the Demon. Um, that, that design got kiboshed, and I have the only copy of that shirt. All right, so uh, finally, when I just said, you know, all right, we need to have a name, we decided that it would be Beastie. And uh, I, I dug through my notes to try and find uh, or email to see who came up with that name, and I couldn't find it. Um, but the point that I also often like to make is that he's not a demon. People keep referring to him as a demon. A demon is an evil spirit. Uh, rather, he's a daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, which is defined as a deified being, half man, half god. And uh, when you're dealing with software, you need at least half God on your side. So let's start at the very beginning. Uh, where, where did the, the first demon come up? Uh, and uh, it, this is the, the earliest that I know. Uh, it was a, a, a first attempt at doing a drawing. This was actually commissioned by someone named Mike O'Brien. Uh, he used to be in, uh, at a lot of Usenix conferences. He's uh, somewhat older than I am now, and so uh, has been retired for quite a while. Uh, at any rate, uh, this was remuneration uh, for Phil Foglio's, uh, uh, well, let's, let's back up. Phil Foglio had lived in an apartment uh, and th that he shared with somebody else. And this particular apartment had a built-in safe in the wall. And they, they kept their valuables, passports, and other things in there. And then Phil's roommate had left. And Phil's roommate was the only person that knew the combination. And Mike Bryan, or uh, Phil had a bunch of his stuff in the safe and no way of figuring out how to open it. Uh, so Mike O'Brien actually had training as a, and a license, actually, to be a locksmith. Uh, he, now, he admitted to me that he knew nothing about safes, but he had a book that said how to do it. And apparently, it was a pretty cheap based safe. So in about 15 minutes, he was able to get the safe open. And so the remuneration that he got from Phil was that Phil would draw this picture. Uh, and uh, so this was, this was drawn. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that the, because of the way uh, it got printed, uh, the PDP-11 is backwards from what it ought to be. Uh, but uh, at any rate, other than that minor detail, uh, it has the, the PDP-11, which of course was what ran Unix at the time, and you know we've got dev null over here, and we've got the you know pipes and so on and so forth. And so then he came up with these little characters that are running around, and those are the the, the background demons that are you know running things to to get work done for you. Okay, so this. Uh, uh, image was uh, passed off to a family uh, shirt printing shop that was in Chicago, and they made up a bunch of these shirts. There were uh, four of them that were made with spe special uh, uh, bread frill on the, the sleeves and around the base, uh, and those uh, shirts went to 
Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Mike O'Brien, and Mike O'Brien kept two of them. Uh, and in fact, this is one of them that I borrowed from Mike O'Brien long enough to take this picture and then had to send back to him. Uh, the actual artwork uh, stayed at the, the family shop, and then they closed, and uh, Armando Stettner at DEC got it because he wanted to, to use it for publicity for the DEC PDP-11 stuff that uh, ran Unix. And uh, when I contacted Armando Stettner to see what had happened to it, uh, he had no idea. So as far as we know, that artwork is now lost. Yeah, there's, the, the, the posters are actually quite, quite a few still around. Okay, so the next sort of step of that was that USENIX got uh, their hand, well, they, they wanted to use the same image, and so in June of 1985, on their 10th anniversary, uh, they printed up this shirt, and you'll see that it's essentially the exact same image, uh, with the exception that Folio's signature is uh, somehow missing off of this picture. Uh, this, this will be a theme that you're going to hear. Uh, when, when things get used, they love to drop the artist's signature off of them. So, uh, well, more to come on that topic. Okay, so now we get to the very first John Lasseter drawn demon. Uh, it was drawn in black and white and was used on the, the BSD manual covers. And how in the world did John Lasseter ever get pulled into doing this? I'm going to tell you. Uh, who is John Lasseter? Yes, uh, John Lasseter. How many people in this room know who John Lasseter is? You're right, not too many people know. Uh, John Lasseter uh, started out as an animation uh, person for Walt Disney. And there are three levels of, of, of people that work there. So there's the, the top level people, and they draw things a frame apart. And then the people that are directly below them on the food chain are called the in-betweeners. And so they fill in the, the other 29 frames from this one to that one. And then the lowest people on the totem pole are the colorizers, and they're the ones that fill in the colors of these, fill, of these cells. And the only sort of artistic thing is that they get to draw like the, the tail, uh, you know, and so they get the tail to go boo or something like that, you know, so that's, that's their, their call in lot. Uh, at any rate, um, all of Disney stuff was done by hand. It was every single frame was drawn, colorized, and, and uh, filmed. And uh, they, that's just how they started, and that's how they continued doing it. So John Laster was one of the top-level guys, the one that did uh, a cell apart. And uh, those people were treated kind of like university professors. And so they, uh, as a university professor, every five or six years, you get a sabbatical. And it's where you get six months where you're still paid, but you just get to go off and do whatever like, suits you. And so John Laster got a six-month sabbatical, and he decided that he would go spend it at Lucasfilm. Uh, this was right after the very first Star Wars had come out, and that was all done with models and, and uh, blue screen and so on in the traditional way. But uh, the goal was to try and get more computerization in there. And a lot of that was just digitizing the models and you know, being able to, to do things with them uh, more readily. Uh, but one of the, the sort of external projects that they were working on at, at Lucasfilm at that point was what they wanted to call an animator's workstation. And there they had these people that knew all about computer graphics and, and how to make computer graphics sing, but they hadn't a clue what someone that actually wanted to do animation would want as a user interface. And so by having John Lasseter come there, they had six months of somebody basically tell them, this is crap, you need to do this, you need to do that, this is, you know, work this way, et cetera. And so by the end of six months, they had developed something which John Laster was really excited about. And so he went, his sabbatical ended, and he went back to Disney and said, you know, we need to move forward, we need to 
get a bunch of these animators' workstations, and this is, this is the new way uh, going forward, uh, computers in, in animation. Well, uh, this was not well received by Disney. They explained to him that we differentiate ourselves from all these other people who are also doing it all by hand uh, because we just have the highest quality, which was true. And, you know, why should we give up our, our franchise to, you know, something that might or might not work? And besides, anybody can buy computers. So uh, John Lasseter was rather demoralized by this. And so he ended up leaving uh, Disney and going to, back to Lucasfilm to become an employee there. All right, timeline-wise, um, we were just in the midst of finishing up 4.2 BSD, and uh, Sam Leffler was one of the people that was working on that project, and he was done with, with working on BSD. He wanted to move on to something else, and so he ended up going to Lucasfilm uh, to start working on some of the things that they were doing there. And uh, so he was actually at Lucasfilm when John Lasseter came back and began working there full time. And one of the things for 4.2 was we were going to put out manuals and we needed a picture to go on the front of the manuals. And so he showed the, the, the previous pictures that I've been showing you here of the demon saying, you know, we need something like this. And so John Lasseter then drew this, this image. So this was the first uh, of the, this style of demon. And you can see, uh, again, you know, in, in the style, uh, if you look at the feet, you know, they look a lot like the feet that you saw uh, back here. Whoops. Okay, so if you look at the feet uh, on these demons here, uh, they look, again, a, a lot more like the feet you see here. You're not wearing any shoes or anything. Okay, so uh, this is, again, uh, on the, the, the front of the FreeBSD manual, uh, the 4.2 uh, manuals. Uh, these were actually printed by the USENIX organization because at that time, you had to be licensed, have a license from AT&T to have Unix, and uh, Usenix had such a license, and so they could you know, make sure that the manuals were only sold to people that had appropriate licensing. Okay, so this original version of Demon, oh, and you'll notice uh, that the Demon, uh, in the glowing orb there, it says Unix, uh, Unix TM. Uh, and so this was something that uh, became a bone of contention later. So you'll see in some of the later demons, it's just a glowing orb with nothing on it. Uh, and yes, George. Oh, what did Lasseter do after that? Well, he, 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 uh, Lucasfilm uh, eventually, uh, after the, the first three Star Wars came out, then he didn't have the money coming in, so he couldn't spend nearly as lavishly as he had been, so he spun off the computer people into this little sub-company that he called Pixar. And uh, so John Laster went to Pixar, and up to that point, they hadn't done any kind of animation that was more than a couple minutes. Uh, you know, Andrew and Wally B was an example uh, that they would, you know, show at conferences and things like that. Uh, and John had always wanted to do a feature-length film. And so uh, eventually, you know, they just didn't have the resources to do that. But uh, Steve Jobs got involved, and Steve Jobs then got a contract with Walt Disney, and Walt Disney controlled everything, so they said, all right, we get your first five films, and doing, a, you know, a reprise of one doesn't count as another film. They've got to be five distinct films. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we're going to completely pay for it, but we get 90% of all the proceeds that come in from the movies. Uh, after they'd had the first two successful ones, those terms got calmed down a little bit. But uh, at any rate, John Laster then was put in charge of the first movie, which you may have heard of. It's called Toy Story. 
And uh, so he and uh, various and sundry other people did that. Uh, he went on and uh, was involved in a lot of the other uh, early pic uh, Pixar movies uh, and is now retired. Um, but uh, uh, when I was coming time to get the, the third demon that he did, uh, well, I'll get to that story when we get there. Okay. Do we really have to be done by five? I barely started. <laughs> Okay, so there were a number of uses uh, that came out from this original demon. Uh, this was a colorized version which got done, and this is the first time you start seeing him wearing shoes. You know, I mean, the demon, he wasn't really a, a shoe kind of character, you know, but people are like, oh, well, that's too informal. He doesn't have any clothes on, but he needs to have shoes. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, uh, I have an example of this shirt up here. Uh, you'll see there's actually quite a few shirts up here. I'm going to highlight a couple of them. I, I need to... Yes. Okay. So uh, this shirt comes with a limited warranty on the back of it. And, and I'm going to read the limited warranty because it's particularly amusing. This shirt is provided as is with no warranty either expressed or implied. Any damages incurred from wearing this shirt are the sole responsibility of the wearer. The wearer should be prepared to briefly explain hundreds of times what BSD and Unix mean. Remember, that's not well known at that time. The wearer should also note that this shirt is not flame retardant, bulletproof, or associated with any toll-free 800 numbers. <laughs> Modifications to the shirt are allowed as long as this notice and the Unix trademarks remain intact. The shirt owner may freely allow others to wear this shirt within the express terms and limitations of this license. What, what, uh, what year would this have been? Uh, late 19, uh, mid 1980s. Uh, it was right around the time of the lawsuit of the number. Yes. In fact, it was probably. Yeah, that, that's probably what triggered this uh, particular warning, in fact. Uh, the, the BSDI, uh, when they first started up, uh, did, did a few things that were, were sort of brilliant marketing but didn't, weren't thought through on the legal side. So, for example, uh, they had a phone number, 1-800-IT'S-UNIX. And for some reason, AT&T took comeuppance with this. Oh, and then they also promoted the fact that it was Unix at 99% off what AT&T charges. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, St. Olaf's College was one of the early uh, organizations that they used FreeBSD in their computer science department, and so I they, you know, asked if they could put this on their, their computer science uh, t-shirt, and uh, I did agree to it. And of course, the deal with that is that then I, uh, the royalties that I would collect when I would agree to let them use it uh, were two copies of the shirt, uh, ostensibly one for me and, and one for my partner, Eric. Uh, except that Eric pretty quickly is like, you know, will you just stop giving me all these demon shirts? There's nowhere I can wear them. <laughs> okay, so uh, this again is still using the early demon, and it's the uh, Bay Area Large Installed System Administrators uh, t-shirt. So I got a, one of these to show you. So Bay Lisa on, Bay Lisa on the front. And uh, then on the back is uh, the, you know, working on uh, Ethernet cable. None of you probably even know what that is, but anyway, it was the way we used to do the Internet. I had to approve it, and I felt that it was close enough. And at least they came and asked me. That's why I got a, two copies of it. Um, that particular one is the one that Eric has never worn and said, yeah, you can get rid of this one. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The last of the ones in this style uh, was one that was 
uh, done by the, the uh, folks that uh, were responsible for RDIST, uh, which was an early version of RSync. Uh, and again, uh, trying to promote, you know, that you know, basically letting somebody arbitrarily push software to your system is a perfectly fine and peaceful thing to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th this is a version, an early version of, of one of the stitched shirts. So uh, a, a stitch pattern of the, the BSD guy. And then I think I have one more picture here. Uh, oh, yeah, no. Yes. Okay. Oh, you could, yes. All right, so. Um, let me get back. All right, you come here. Yeah. Because this is another bit of a story before I get to showing things. Actually, what I can do is get you to show the things. Oh, I could. Yeah, and yes. that, that would work that even better. Show, what do you want me to show? Uh, well, in a minute, I'm going to have you show that picture, but let me talk about it first. Okay, so you've now seen the first John Lasseter and a whole bunch of stuff about the first John Lasseter. The second John Lasseter was uh, when we finally did the 4.3 BSD textbook. Uh, we had been wanting to do a textbook about BSD since about 1983. And in order, we, we went to Addison Wesley, they were all excited about it, uh, and they said, of course, you, we need to get a release from uh, AT&T to have you talk about it. And so we went to AT&T, and AT&T said, uh, we're not really sure about that. I mean, they just shut down the John Lyons book, which was one that literally just annotated the source code of an early version of Unix. Uh, but that was like handing out the code. And you know, the code, in those days, this was pre-copyright for code. It was trade secret. And if you, other people can see it, then it's not a trade secret anymore. So I mean, that was a legitimate thing to, to shut down. Uh, but they said, well, we're not really sure you know, whether you'd be divulging too many of our trade secrets. So we'll tell you what, go ahead and write the book, and then we'll read it and let you know if it's okay to publish it. <laughs> well, needless to say, nothing happened. Uh, so then, uh, eventually, uh, get the author of the the book, the, the book about hmm? which, which book? The the one that was written that uh, documenting the, all the interfaces. And, no. System 5 book. Bach. Bach. Bach book. Yes, it was the Bach book. Okay. okay, so I'm not good. See, it's not just me that can't remember names. It takes a work. Okay, so the Bach book came out in 1986. And the Bach book was, uh, it documented, like, literally, you know, this function with these parameters, and you call it, and it does this, and so on and so forth, which was way lower in the system than we were going to talk about. We were going to talk about the high-level structure and algorithms and so on. And so we took this book to uh, Addison Wesley and said, look, they've just allowed one of their people to publish this book, and we're not going to get into anywhere near this level of detail, so, you know, what do you say? Will you pr publish it? And they said, okay. So it took us two years, but in 1988, we were finally ready to publish. And instead of being 4.2, by that time we had 4.3. And so the first book that we did, which George is about to show you, uh, was the 4.3 BSD book. Uh, should you care to, when you're done, come up and look at it, that is a signed first edition. And uh, at any rate, <laughs> um, there was also a, an answer book that we did because it was so popular uh, that uh, they, they said, well, how about an answer book so it can be used in courses? And uh, that was so popular that it even got translated into Japanese, um, as was the, the textbook. And in fact, Hiroki, uh, who's in our audience here, was one of the people that helped oversee that translation. And it was one of the best translations that was ever done of any version of our book. Um, okay, so the story about this actually being done, uh, you can now show the picture, is that uh, this is still, we're still back at uh, Lucasfilm. Actually, it might have been Pixar by then, but uh, 
John Laster is still there, and uh, as is Sam Leffler. So uh, Sam says, well, John, you know, you did the, that original black and white one, but could you do a color one for our, our 4.3 textbook? And so when you come up and take a look at this, he literally pulled a piece of blue cardboard out of the trash can grabbed some chalk off the chalkboard, this is pre-whiteboard days, and drew this whole thing up in the space of, I was told, about 20 minutes. Uh, and you'll notice, both in the earlier one and this one, that he has a very Disney-like look to him. It looks like the kind of a character that you would see in a Disney movie. And the reason is because he had been a lead animator for Disney for 20 years and just had that in his head. Uh, luckily, Disney has never come after us, so thank goodness for that, because they have a huge checkbook. I mean, they, they bribed Congress to give them 120 years of copyrights, and I think they may even push that a bit further. Anyway, uh, the upshot was that we then got this, and uh, you can't see it, but when you come up, uh, you'll see right under his tail there, it is signed by John Lasseter, J. Lasseter 88. And you'll see on the textbook that his name is not there because, of course, we'd never put the artist's name because who would know or care? Uh, I did credit him, so if you go to the copyright page, you'll see that he is credited with having done that bit of work, and that was as far as I was able to get. Uh, putting this on the cover of our textbook, by the way, was another amusing story. Uh, we basically went to Addison Wesley and said, oh, we've got the artwork for the front cover of this book. And they took a look at it and they go, oh, no, you don't. This is a serious computer science textbook. We're not putting some cranky cartoon character on the front of it. Um, but someone had told me that authors get a certain amount of control. And so I just said, no, no, um, you know, there's not a lot I'm asking for, but this is going on the cover. And so they, they, they did, in fact, get it. Uh, you'll notice that the glowing orb was supposed to say BSD Unix, but uh, that got kiboshed. Uh, so it's just a glowing orb. Uh, and uh, at any rate, uh, we got it onto the book, and that book then proceeded to sell 50,000 copies, which was a, a record. I mean, the, uh, the person that was sort of overseeing the, the, the you know, our our contact at Addison Wesley said, yes, I walked in wearing one of the t-shirts at you know, one of the meetings. You know, normally they're all in those days in you know, suits and white shirts and ties and so on. Uh, and, and everyone just smiled at me because he had the best-selling textbook at that point. Uh, yeah. OK, so um, you've already showed the textbook. Uh, and. Uh, Again, you can see the, the Lassiter name has disappeared underneath the tail there. Okay, so, yeah, I just showed that one actually earlier, but that, that's the, the stitch work that ended up uh, on this shirt. Um, also, you can show one of the, to the left, also. Oh, yeah. uh, You're see tomorrow. I have one, one giving my talk. Yeah, so. I, I actually uh, commissioned somebody to do a, a larger stitching pattern. Uh, it turns out that there are 24,999 stitches because that's the limit of what the stitching machines can deal at, at that time. And so they, they actually, it was slightly over that, and I sent it to the company, and they said, it crashes our computer. You need to get rid of some stitches. <laughs> so I went back so to the... Why don't you run units instead of dots? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so there should be, that should be on that pile somewhere, I think. Maybe, if it's, all right. No, all right. Don't, it's not that critical. Um, this was a shirt um, that I did. I had a two-month tour of Australia. Uh, they, in Australia, they had a, 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 a spring meeting and a fall meeting, and the fall meeting, uh, was always uh, a, a central meeting so for the whole country in some place. But then the spring meeting, 
uh, each of the seven states had uh, their own meeting, and they were they set them up so they were a week apart. And so I would come in, I'd fly in, uh, and I'd be for a week in that city. Uh, I'd usually teach a one or two day tutorial, and I'd give a talk, uh, and I'd have two or three days to run around and see things. Uh, and it was one of those ones where, you know, I was going to be traveling for two months. The thought of being in a hotel for two months was a bit over the top. And so I said, you know, you guys are on a low budget. I hate hotels for that long. So you can, if you can just find somebody, you know, that's in, that will put me up at their house. Uh, you know, occasionally you end up in the middle of a dysfunctional family, but, you know, it's like a week. You can put up with it. Um, and usually it's, it's, it's pretty rare when that happens. Uh, but the other thing was, this is before the days where everybody's pictures were all over the internet. And so it was also a, 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 the days when you could just come to the gate. So I would land you know, Darwin, Australia, or wherever I was going, and I'd walk off the plane, and now I had no idea other than the name of the person who it was that was supposed to pick me up. And I would just scan the set of people that were standing there, and you can pretty quickly say, all right, it's either that guy or that guy. Uh, just from the way they're dressed and the way they look. You know, they, they had that sort of geek look to them. <laughs> so I, I would just walk up and say, uh, hi, I'm Kirk McCusick. I'm looking for John Doyle or whoever it was it's supposed to be. And half the time they'd go, oh, that's me. How did you know? And it's like, clairvoyance. Uh, <laughs> the other half of the time they'd go, ah, uh, no. And so, oh, sorry, sir. You know, I, I never had to go past two. I'd always, if I didn't get it on the first one, I'd always got it on the second one. And uh, anyway, the, uh, the, one of the things I would do is I'd say, you know, I'd go in and, and uh, uh, well, in the case of Darwin, uh, I had just uh, come from Melbourne, and I was staying with Robert Ells in Melbourne. Uh, it, he was still living in the house he grew up in. I said, well, how did that work out? Did your parents die? And he goes, no, kids grow up, parents move out. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he was totally into cricket, and, and he was a member of the cricket club, and that's one of these things where there's like a 25-year waiting list to get into it. But his parents had put him on the list when they first got married, which was about 15 years before uh, he was born. And so by a large single-digit age, uh, he was in the club, and of course his parents were in the club, and so he was going. And so if there was a cricket match, uh, that he was just, he was there. That was, you know, everything else came to a screeching halt. And this is like cricket the way it's supposed to be played. It goes over seven days. You know, you go in the morning, you have a lunch break, you go through the afternoon. You know, it goes on for four to five days until it finally happens. They, they now have speed cricket where they do it in one day, if you can believe that. Um, really slow, yeah. Um, anyhow, uh, the, we, we were, we of course, there was some cricket going on at that point, so he took us to the to the Cricket Dome, which is this amphitheater that holds 70,000 people. And uh, it was pretty full, except that we were in the group that got to like sit in chairs on the field, and little people would run out and give you beverages and food and all the rest of it. And the cricket players would come walking by, and you know the, the, these people all knew them, and they would be high-fiving them and saying, oh, good play, blah, blah, blah. It was pretty weird. Anyway, um, so I now I fly to Darwin, the entire population of, of the Northern Territory in which Darla, Darwin exists is 140,000 people, of, of which something like 35,000 live in Darwin. So, uh, you know, the entire population of, of the Northern Territory, well, half the Northern Territory population would fit in the place that I had just been full of people in Melbourne. Uh, and the airport is sort of what you might expect in an outback post like that. Uh, there's a, a, a landing strip, and then there's just a, one of those sort of metal half-dome things that looks like it's from a World War II thing, probably was. Um, and so, and it's blazing hot there because you're almost up towards the equator. And I, so I come walking off this plane, this is in the middle of summer, and I, you know, it's like I'm walking across the black macadam, and it's, it's so hot that my shoes are going chick, 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 as I sort of pick them up off the, so I, I, I like make a beeline to get into the terminal where it presumably will be air conditioned. Air conditioning is two overhead fans that are moving at about that rotational speed and it is uh, beastly hot in there. So I just come in outside the building where everyone else is and stand in the shade 
while they unload the luggage, which is just taking it off the plane and putting it on a cart. And then they pull the cart over next to the building, and it's up to you to get your bag off the cart. Um, at any rate, uh, I get my bag, and we go to the parking lot, which is just a grass strip. There's no parking fee. But anyway, uh, the, the person's uh, vehicle is, you know, it's a 4x4, four four and it's got the exhaust pipe comes up and has a little manifold here, and the air intake has things comes up with a thing over here, and it's a diesel engine, so there's no ignition. So you know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, this is kind of nuts, but all right, whatever. And we get in and uh, we roll down the windows, and you know, all right, so we've aired out the hot air. And I say, oh well, shouldn't we roll up the windows and turn on the AC? And he goes, I don't think the AC has worked in this in years. Um, in fact, I get to his house and there's no AC in the house either. He said, oh, but we'd like to take a shower. You look kind of sweaty. I say, yeah. I said, would you like me to turn on the hot water? I'm like, uh, maybe not. And <laughs> because that's the cool sounds good. I turn on the cold water, and it's coming out of the ground at, at 94 degrees. So it's, you know, not cool at all. You know, and I'm trying to shave with my electric shaver, and it's like my face is just sweating. So I wipe it with a towel and go with the razor as fast as I can, but it just clogs because of all the sweat that's coming off. Um, they did have an, one of the overhead fans in my room, and I just lay on top of the bed. And when I get up in the morning and sit up, there's an outline of me in sweat on the bed. Anyway, he says, you get used to it. And it's true, you do get used to it. Um, but uh, it, it was an interesting experience. Anyway, on the off days, I would say, well, you know, could I borrow your car? And you know, I'll drop you at work, and then I'll go out and tourist around, and then you know, come back and pick you up at the end of the day. He goes, oh, no, no, I'll take the day off. I, oh, no, you don't need to do that. No, I'd like to. It's like, well, you offered twice, so you're stuck. And uh, it turns out it was a good thing he did this, because he took, a set, took me out into the outback. And you go through these gullies, and the gullies have these little uh, think posts with measurements of depth. And I'm like, what's that for? And he goes, oh, well, you know, if there's a flash flood, you need to know how deep it is. And you know, you know your vehicle you know, can't go through more than a certain depth of water because uh, it, you know, it'll float, and then you won't be able to control where you're going. So um, it's like, OK, fine. Uh, anyway, so we get way out there. And then I, I hadn't quite realized, because it was my first day there, that they have downpours every afternoon at this time of year. And so, of course, we get this just you know, torrential downpour. So now we're starting to head back. And suddenly, those things that had been dry are full of water. You know, and we get to the first one, and it's like two feet. He's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know? And we go in, and, and you, know, we're, you hear the engine sort of burble, 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 and coming up. And he's like, oh, I understand why he's got those things now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then finally, we get to one uh, where it's, uh, it's just sort of at a borderline. So he actually gets out and he walks across to see, you know, to see how high it goes on him. And OK, that's going to be OK. And so we go through that. And we get to the next one, and it's, it's not even that deep. And I say, he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about this one. I said, does it mean you have to walk across it? And he goes, no, we're going to wait till it gets down to an acceptable level. I say, what's the difference? You know, a higher current or something? He goes, uh, no, th this one has crocodiles in it. And, uh, <laughs> Like I said, I was glad he was in charge of driving. OK. Um, well, enough of this story. So uh, commentary about the uh, demon. This, this was uh, FreeBSD you know, sticking it to DOS. Uh, this, this turned out to be, I, I normally don't let the demon be involved in anything that would be deemed to be violent, but I figured He's just popping a balloon. And he's popping a really useful balloon. So let's go for it. OK. So now this brings us up to the third uh, version of the BSD demon. Again, draw, drawn by John Lasseter. And you can see uh, this was commissioned for the 4.4 BSD book, which George will also show you. And uh, you'll notice on the 4.4 book, his signature appears on the front cover, because by this time, he's a famous person. So of course, we're going to have his signature on the front cover. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had gone to John and said, uh, you know, I, I want you to do another version of the demon. And you know, the, the previous ones were kind of static. You know, so I want something with a little more action going on it. And uh, 
So he, he actually did some, some hand sketches, which I was trying to find but couldn't find to bring down here. Uh, and so I picked the, the one that was kind of like this. And so then uh, I need, you know, fine, he'd agreed to do it and draw it and so on. And, but he was in the middle of Toy Story. Toy Story was just coming to conclusion of production. And of course, he was just manically busy. And so uh, I, I made friends with his secretary. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd say, well, you know, any idea when John might be able to do this? And she'd say, oh, well, you know, I'm talk I've talked to him. He's ready to do blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, I had some reason that I was going by there, so I just decided to drop in and, and, and see her. Uh, this was in the days when you could still, like, walk into the facility. And uh, I said, you know, oh, how's it going? You know, oh, well, um, you know, uh, he, uh, he got his pen set out and asked me to get them cleaned up and, and you know, inked. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I think that's forward progress. And so I thanked her and I also gave her a box of chocolates, uh, which uh, did seem to help move things along. Anyway, um, I then, you know, got a call from her and uh, she said, okay, it's done. It's ready to pick up. And I, you know, I, so I went in and I, you know, saw the picture and, she said, yeah, I, I put the paper down and the pens and the inks all down. And he just sort of sat there and froze and said, it's been five years since I've drawn a cell. I don't even know if I still have that skill set. And then dipped the black pen in and went tch, 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 tch. This was done in under 10 minutes, hmm. colorizing everything. Um, at any rate, uh, she got a whole bunch of flowers for that one. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you'll notice here that, uh, you know, he'd just been standing at pointing at the orb, and now he's, like, trying to skewer the orb, and so the orb is, like, tick, taken off like a shot. So the problem when we gave this to the Addison Wesley people is they say, that looks too much like a sperm cell. So when you look at the front of the book, you'll notice that it's, the glowing orb is missing. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's not to be found anywhere on that book. <laughs> they put his signature there, but not the glowing orb. <laughs> anyway, uh, actually, that gets back to the, the previous book for a minute. Uh, when they, that went out for sale uh, in Nebraska, this... Hmm? No, yeah, that's true. Uh, it, the, the, right. So when this book came out, it, you know, it was available, you know, all over the place. And so uh, the school board for the state of Nebraska had to approve it for the, the school library. And they looked at it and they said, oh no, this has got the devil on the front cover. We can't possibly <laughs> allow this into our school. They didn't look inside the book, mind you. So I get this panicked letter from, from Addison Wesley saying, oh my god, you know, we've got to write something explaining why it's okay for this book to be in their library. I'm telling George about this, and George is, I said, no, don't do that. Just put a big thing across the front of the book that says, banned in Nebraska. And uh, anyway, they didn't take him up on that idea. They got it into the school board. All, probably one copy that got sold there. Okay, so you've already seen it, the cover of the 4.4 book. And then, of course, uh, having been successful, there should be in this, yeah. Uh, I went back to the same person that had done the, uh, the stitching for the 4.3 and got this one. At this time, the, the machines had improved. They could get all the way up to 32,766 stitches. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, minus two. minus two. I think they were just being cautious. <laughs> you know, they might start at zero and count zero or something. I don't know. Anyway, the, uh, uh, oh, actually that other one that's on the top there, yeah, that, that's an earlier one. Uh, but this was done by some folks that were fans of the Atlantic, Atlanta Braves uh, baseball team, uh, which had a, a, an Indian theme back in those days that they no longer have for good reason. Uh, anyway, uh, they made... You know, got this T-shirt, and uh, I agreed that 
since that was the team logo that they, I mean, team hatchet, that they could do that. Okay, uh, then the t-shirts, the Yes, okay, so now there's two different versions of this uh, that got made. Uh, there was this one, which was the standard one that anybody could get, and then there was one that had no text on it. And the only way that you could get one of those was if you were, you had commit privileges to the, the machines at Berkeley. Uh, or actually if you'd contributed and had some of your code committed. That, that was another reason you could get it. Okay. So now continue forward, and uh, actually, yeah, I didn't bring these pictures. Uh, these, these pictures are considerably bigger, and I was just afraid that they would get broken if I brought them. So uh, along comes the, uh, the, the release of the, the, open, the, the Net2 version of BSD, which uh, we, we had done Net1, which was just the TCP IP code and you know, all the way through all the utilities, you know, the important things like R login and RSH, thank God finally got rid of. Uh, and at any rate, the, uh, that was fine, no, no problem with that. But then uh, we started getting a lot of requests for, well, can't you give us more? And uh, Keith Bostick uh, basically set about, you know, trying to get the utilities and libraries done. We'd go to Usenix conferences and he'd get up and say, you know, get your name in lights, you know, rewrite some of the utilities or parts of the libraries, and, um, you know, we thought, yeah, that'll work. Uh, and this stuff would come in, and, you know, it was some of the easy things, you know, cat, and, you know, then, then someone tackled LS, and just the number of options in LS makes it a bigger program. Uh, and these things would come in, and I would say many of them were rather amateurish in the terms of their, the way they were written. So Keith would pretty much rewrite it from top to bottom, but he wouldn't put his name on it. It was always the name of the contributor. And I said something like, Keith, you basically wrote this. Why, you know, at least put your name on there. He goes, there's no end to the good you can do in this world by giving credit to other people. And furthermore, that's who they're going to go after if ATT is <laughs> concerned about it. <laughs> so, uh, the upshot was that uh, Mike and I, Mike Carls and I were in charge of uh, dealing with the kernel, uh, but we couldn't really say, you know, <laughs> rewrite, you know, the kernel. So we weren't quite sure how to deal with that, but we figured that Keith wasn't going to get anywhere. So he comes walking into our office at some point and says, uh, well, guys, I've got uh, over half of the libraries and utilities done. How's that kernel coming? And uh, I look at Mike, and Mike looks at me and goes, holy shit, we're going to have to do something. <laughs> And uh, so we're like, well, how do we deal with this? And Keith Bostick, in his usual way, came up with the great answer. He said, uh, well, we started from 32V. So we took the original source code to 32V, and uh, then we uh, ran it through a, the, the, CB, the, uh, the C beautifier to put it in a standard format, uh, and then built an inverted database, or built a, a database of every line. Uh, and then we did the same thing with uh, the, our kernel, and then did a line-by-line -line match. And so, you know, with, are there any, what in our kernel matches something that was in 32V? And, you know, a brace on a line by itself, you know, those kinds of things you ignore. But if you get two or three or certainly four lines that were identical, you go, aha, we need to do something about that. So I remember, like, one of the early ones was to, when, you know, you're doing something where you need to look up a process, so, you, you know, the system call gives you a PID, and it was just a linear search through, you know, the originally 16 possibilities, uh, but uh, <laughs> it was getting to be a linear search through a rather longer list, and we're like, well, well, we should do a hash lookup for that, and that, of course, is a different implementation, so not only did it get rid of the AT&T code, it also made it work better. Um, anyway, so we did a lot of that. And we had it down to the point where there were really only about six files left that there was any significant matching. And we were ready to just tackle those. And Mike says, you know, if we release a complete system, that's going to just raise a lot more red flags than if we just say, well, it's an incomplete kernel. We've just released the parts that we could release. Uh, and not really mention the fact that there's only six files that aren't in there. Well, we put the six files in, but just the templates for what the calls ought to be. 
Uh, and uh, so that then uh, became networking release two. And so far, that, that started out fine. Uh, and in fact, we had lots and lots of people it, that paid $1,000 to get it. I mean, we figured we'd sell three copies. It would go up on the net for free download, and that would be that. But people felt that the $1,000 for the piece of paper from the university that says you're free to redistribute this was worth the money. Uh, and they'd often say, don't bother sending the tape. Uh, at any rate, uh, we sold about 1,000 of those. So about a million dollars came in from that, which was good because this company called BSDI started up, and I'd already talked about, uh, ended up being sued by AT&T. And uh, so, the, you know, they get into the first court, and they said, well, we only wrote these six files. Uh, all the rest of these, there's this piece of paper from the University of California that says it's, you know, uh, freely redistributable. And uh, so which of these six files is problematic for you? Well, of course, those had been, you know, done in a clean room and were completely fine. And so, you know, the judge says, well, you know, I guess I'm going to just throw this case out. Uh, so then they co-sued uh, the University of California. And, of course, as soon as the University of California got it, uh, they stopped distributing it like that mattered. I mean, we'd already sent out, you know, a gazillion copies. Uh, so that, that wasn't any sort of a big setback. But then the university's like, well, why exactly should we actually be defending this? I mean, you know, we're not, you know, not making any money on it, and you know. Uh, uh. So anyway, we had some money. We said, well, we'll, we'll we can cover some of the cost, um, but you know, it was things like, well, we need an expert to go up against their, you know, world-class expert. Well, we don't have the money for that, so I got to be the expert, um, and uh, that's another whole story. But I'm not going to tell that one right now. At any rate, because uh, we're on the demon, so. As part of this, I decided, well, we needed to have some T-shirts, you know, to fight back on this. And I, I, the chances of getting John Lasseter to do this again was just like zero. So uh, I went to a friend of ours who's a, a, a portrait artist. And so this was nothing like anything she'd ever done before. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I want to get a couple pictures that I can use on T-shirts. Uh, so this was one where she has the demon slam dunking the Death Star uh, through the hoop. And uh, the, the logo that we put underneath this on the shirt was Net 2 USL 0. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, I have no copies of that shirt. But I do have the next one. OK. Yes, so this, this. Yes, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, back in Star Wars 1, there was this big thing called the Death Star. That was, that yeah, I know. So we felt that this, this was a brand new logo for AT&T. And we said, that logo looks like the Death Star. And so it became known as the Death Star logo. Thank you, George, for that bit of uh, help. OK, so on this particular one, uh, we have the demon standing on top of the world in my Birkenstocks, I might add, uh, skewering the Death Star. And uh, this one we did on shirts that said, free the Berkeley 4.4. So you can show one of those. And uh, then I think the next one in the pile is the same one, but without the text, which again is the same story of being the, the special one that uh, you, know, you had to be an inside person in order to get it. So anyway, this, these shirts sold extremely well. Uh, and uh, in fact, I still have a, uh, a check from Dennis Ritchie for one of them, which I chose not to cash. Uh, and, uh, but Dennis said, look, Kirk, I, I understand where you're coming from. I support what you're doing. But that logo that you're using is the AT&T logo. And it's not AT&T that's suing you. It is USL. And I would really appreciate it if you would use the USL logo on your T-shirts. So I did a new run of the T-shirts with the USL logo. Yes, you do. <laughs> OK, so. And I have, of course, the original artwork for this. C. Peel, you can see, signed there. 
Uh, she didn't normally sign her artwork, or if she did only on the back, but I prevailed on her. I said, you know, this is commercial art. You need to sign the front. Uh, and if you look through all, there's not another single one of her pictures. Actually, there's one other that she did for me that she signed, but that's it. Okay, so again, here's just the shirt. Uh, so now it ended up also being used, I think there's one in there. Yes, so um, try the left pile, far left pile well, maybe, no? Yeah. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, so FreeBSD uh, first came out, and so you know, they wanted to get a t-shirt. Uh, there's, of course, the, the very well-known one uh, from Walnut Creek, where it's sort of the demon walking with the, the, the CD walk, you know, rolling out in the head of him. Um, but this was the very first one before they uh, you know, had gotten that, that logo. Uh, so this is just the same one that you've seen, but it adds the FreeBSD at the top, uh, and the daemon is free uh, because it's you know, the free distribution. And, uh, of course, John Lasseter always appears on anything I do. Other uh, of the d groups also used the daemon early on. Uh, so this was uh, an early uh, NetBSD. I don't think I have that one. Uh, and even OpenBSD uh, was using the daemon early on. And I have I had one more. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation had the daemon in a, in a suit. Uh, and I thought I had put that in here, but it turns out I didn't, and I don't have it with me. But uh, if I ever give this talk again, I'll, I'll add that one. Uh, of course, all of the distributions and the foundation have now all gone away from using the daemon, uh, mostly because uh, the, the PR in some parts of the world is not so great because it's viewed as an evil spirit, so, uh, and rightly, you know, have moved on to their own logos. All right, uh, just for, you know, am amusement and grins and giggles, uh, this is actually the copyright assignment uh, that I got from John Lasseter. More interesting part, of course, is the second page where it's signed by me and also then co-signed by him. Uh, this was assigning it to me as a work for hire uh, uh, and uh, assigning the copyright to me, uh, which I then, of course, filed with the Copyright Office. Uh, and it turns out, someone pointed out to me, you know, that was 1988, you got to renew it every 35 years, so I'm actually in the process of uh, getting it renewed. Uh, so I. Also up in the front here, if you're curious, I have copies of these things so you can just see what they look like. Okay, so I, I, I'm almost didn't overrun. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I have time for questions. Uh, there's my email, my website, my YouTube channel. Uh, now, you notice there's this huge pile of shirts up here and uh, there's a whole pile on the right, which are shirts that I've gotten from conferences or other things, which I have too many duplicates of, and they're in piles by size. So there's a medium pile, a large pile, extra large pile, etc. cetera. Um, they are free. You can come up, you can go through. If you want one, take it. In fact, I'll be really happy if they disappear, and Eric will be even more happy if they disappear. <laughs> Um, the ones on the left in the front here are the vintage ones that I have. These are ones that I've actually paid for and used to sell. So I'm simply selling them off uh, if you want them. Anything that's a t-shirt is, I say $20, but that's tax included. So it's like $17 plus $3 tax. Uh, similarly, the polo shirts are $40. Um, you can give me cash, and I also have the ability to take credit cards. So uh, at this point, it's come up and uh, just take a look through things. <laughs> And, and take a shirt if you want them. <laughs>